Yoo-hoo. That was just kind of spur of the moment. I didn't plan on doing that at all until I watched the announcements. So if you weren't watching the announcements, you have no idea what I just did. It's important that you watch the announcements. Those guys are nuts. They're characters, and uh, we love them. Hey, we're glad that you're here this morning. For those joining online, we're so glad that you're with us today, too. Um, Three weeks until Christmas. Can you believe it? I was thinking this morning as I parked across at the student campus and I'm walking across the parking lot and it's still dark outside, I'm thinking only just about two and a half weeks until the shortest day of light of the year and then the days start getting longer, warmer. Hey, it's hard to believe that we're almost already there, but it's almost Christmas. Isn't the place decorated really nice? We, uh, I think we missed an opportunity a couple of weeks ago to thank Jen and her team. There's so many, uh, so much going on. Somebody said, how many Christmas trees? I don't know, a lot. You walk through the building and count the trees. We, we, uh, we love Christmas here. I want to reiterate the kids' musical coming up next Saturday and Sunday. Don't miss that. If you don't have kids or grandkids in that, I encourage you to come. Be here, show your support, and uh, invite someone to come with you for Christmas Eve services. I am teaching a Sunday school class that starts today for young married people. Young is a relative term. We're not IDing people at the door, but uh, if you want to come be part of that, we, uh, we are, we're, I'm excited to be able to do that. And so uh, check out classes, other classes that are happening today, and this Wednesday starts new classes for the Wednesday uh, quarter, so check all of those things out. Hey, this morning we started a new series, this whole month of December, called The Perfect Gift. I want to know how many of you have been or are looking for that perfect gift for that special someone in your life. Anybody? You gave up on that a long time ago? Very good. You know, we put a lot of effort into finding just the right, the right gift, but uh, we may never find it. It might be too difficult to figure out. It might be too expensive. It might be too hard to find. But I want to tell you this morning a perfect gift that is available to everyone, everywhere, and it's free. It's not only free, it will free you uh, from condemnation, from separation from God, from eternal death. And that perfect gift is Jesus Christ himself, our Savior, our Messiah, who came to save us and set us free. Christmas is about the Christ child, Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Over 2,000 years ago now, Jesus fulfilled every one of the Old Testament prophecies, hundreds of prophecies, over 300 prophecies about the Messiah that would be born, and Jesus is the fulfillment of all of those prophecies. He's the fulfillment of God's plan to redeem mankind. He came from heaven to earth. He humbled himself. He became one of his creation. He lived a perfect life here on this earth. He ultimately gave his life, paying the penalty for your sin, for my sin. And as Pastor Luke mentioned this morning, uh, while we were so far from him, he died for us. All of us have sinned. Every single one of us in the room. All of creation has sinned. We've all fallen short of God's perfect plan, his glorious um, plan for us So thankful that uh, even though the wages of sin is death, the Bible says that the free gift of God is salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen? Eternal life. So in this series, we're going to be looking at the names of Jesus, which give us insight into who he is, his attributes, his nature, his purpose, his position. There's over 200 names or titles given for Jesus in Scripture. Many of them prophesied before he ever came to earth, and we're going to be looking at some of those names in the Old Testament. What we find out as we read Scripture is that the name of Jesus is far above every other name. I wonder how many of you know the meaning of your name. Anybody? Google is a great tool. All you have to do is say, what is the meaning of, insert your name. I can tell you what Jeff means. It means God's peace. I will take that. My wife is saying, thank you for being God's peace to me. All I do is bring her peace (laughs) all the time, every day, in every way. Is it true, Jeannie? See, look at her shaking her head. 
You know what genie means? God is gracious. He is gracious to me through genie. She just keeps pouring grace out on me all the time because I need it. Oh, take a minute to look up your name. There's a saying that a picture paints a thousand words, and uh, in Scripture, a name paints a thousand words. Oftentimes, we see names in the Bible, they, they have significance, they have meaning. It's, it, it tells about a person's character, their nature, their personality. Isaac, you know what Isaac means. We went through Genesis earlier this year. Isaac means laughter, laughter. Do you remember the angel coming to Sarah when she's 90 years old and said, you are going to give birth to a child, a son? What did she do? She laughed. Who's, who gives birth to a child at 90? But that's Isaac's name. It means laughter. Peter, the name Peter, Jesus gave Simon a new name. He said, your name will be Peter. You remember Jesus asked the disciples, he said, who do you say that I am? And they gave him all kinds of names, and he looks at Peter and says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, whose name was Simon at the time, said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, absolutely right. And upon your confession that I am the Christ, that I am the son of the living God, you will no longer be Simon, you will be Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, on your confession, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail or conquer it. Jesus, if there ever was a, a meaning with a name with infinite meaning and significance, it's the name of Jesus. The angel told Joseph in Matthew chapter one, she will, give a, she will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means Yahweh saves. Remember back in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter three, Moses, God calls him to lead his, his people out of Egypt. And Moses asked him a simple question that I find myself asking God all the time. Who am I? Why me? Who am I that you would ask me to do this? And God simply says, I will be with you. That's enough to know that he is with us. But Moses protested. He said, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, oh, what is his name? And then what should I tell them? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. What does the name I am mean? It means just exactly what it sounds like. I am fill in the blank. I am means eternal, all-encompassing, comprehensive. I am means everything that you will ever need. God's name in Scripture is highly regarded. It's respected and revered all throughout Scripture. Psalm 29 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Psalm 34, O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Psalm 111, holy and awesome is his name. The name Jesus is the same. Philippians 2 says this, therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor, speaking of Jesus, and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the sea, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Acts chapter 4 says there's salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The name of Jesus is powerful. The name of Jesus is life-changing. Have you been saved by the name, by the person, by the power, by the blood of Jesus? If you have in the room, you should say amen. 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 He's so good. Understanding his name helps us to understand him better. And so we're going to be looking at many of his names over the next few weeks. And so I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9. It's in the Old Testament. Go ahead. It's weak. It's weak. But it's December and it's cold. Next week, come ready. I don't even know who's preaching next week, but it'll be, it'll be good. <laughs> Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9. He's speaking of the coming deliverer, the Savior, the Messiah who would lead God's people. 
this prophecy of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 9 is 700 years before Jesus shows up on this earth. In this, what we're going to see, and I read these notes in my fire Bible, thanks to Pastor Kerry, that he would minister exclusively in the area of Galilee. We're going to read this. That he would bring the light of salvation and hope. That this Messiah would expand the community of God's people to include not only the, the Jews, but the Gentiles. That he would be, bring peace by freeing his people from oppression. That he would come from the nation of Israel, and he would reign over God's people forever. Let's read together Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to start with verse 1. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled. But there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness a light will shine. That reminds me of John chapter one where John says this, the apostle John, speaking of Jesus, John chapter one, in the beginning was the word, the word already existed, the word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. That is Jesus Christ. Isaiah was talking about this 700 years before. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel, and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery. And lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Will you join with me as we pray? Father, thank you so much. I thank you, God, that you are an eternal God, that you have all power and authority, that your names say so much about who you are. We cannot pin you down to one character or one quality. You're a God who is far above anything and everything. I thank you today that you have made yourself available to us. And today I pray that we would see you in a whole new light. I pray today that we would surrender our hearts and lives to you, Jesus. Speak to us. Use me. God, who am I? I'm so humble, God, to be able to stand here and share today. God, would you speak through me? Would you speak to us and to our hearts today? We love you and we thank you. Have your way in this place, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're looking at wonderful counselor. Some of your Bibles separate those two, wonderful comma counselor but I think we put them together all the other names go together and it doesn't matter if we separate them or put them together it's the same thing we look at wonderful counselor when would you respond with the word wonderful I may say how is your family doing they're doing wonderful which means good great okay I think I have no idea how to interpret that but the word wonderful here, the base root of the Hebrew word for wonderful is pele, which has to do with wonder. And I think of wonder in the Bible. Jesus, all throughout his ministry, performed signs and wonders, miracles, 
things beyond description. We're going to look at a couple of those things this morning. But he is wonderful in the sense that he's exceptional, that he's incredible, that he is extraordinary. Jesus was constantly filling people with awe and astonishment. To have wonder is to be filled with awe and amazement. You might have felt awe and amazement watching Michael Jordan perform on the court, but that is so minute and minuscule compared to the awe and the awesomeness of our God, Jesus Christ. And when we see his life, his teaching, his wisdom, the signs and the wonders and the miracles that he performed, it is truly a wonder, truly wonderful what he has done. There are three synonyms that we can find for the word wonderful in Webster's thesaurus that we also see attributed to Jesus in Scripture. The first one of those is amazing. At the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, or Matthew chapter 7, it it goes 5, 5, 6, and 7. At the end of chapter 7, it says that when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. There was something about the way that Jesus taught, the way that he spoke with authority was so believable and so amazing, so beyond what their teachers of the law did. He was amazing. It says that they were amazed at his teaching. In Luke chapter 5, there was a paralyzed man that was brought to Jesus And you remember that it was so hard for them to get this man to Jesus that they end up going up and dropping him through the roof to get to him. And in that that verse, it says that, verse 24, Jesus, standing up to them, says, I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And then Jesus turned to this paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Verse 25, and immediately as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home praising God. And everyone was gripped with wonder and awe. And they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. Wonder, awe, and amazement. That is who Jesus is. He's not only amazing, he's awesome, he is astonishing. Matthew chapter 12, verse 23. Jesus heals a man who was blind and he couldn't speak. And he touches him and he heals him and all of a sudden he can see and he can speak. And verse 23 of Matthew chapter 12, all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David. Could this be Messiah? Could this be the the prophesied savior of the world? They were amazed and astonished at the work and the person of Jesus. Everything about him was wonderful, amazing, awesome, and astonishing. He's wonderful. And when we put the word wonderful with counselor, we discover even greater things about Jesus. Not only is, he, is there infinite wonder in his name, there's also infinite wisdom. One of the qualities and characteristics that we see about God and Jesus in the scripture is that he's omniscient, which means that he is all-knowing. Not only is he all-knowing, he is all-wise. Listen to this prophecy of Isaiah chapter 11. He says, out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Out of David's lineage, out of David's line, will become a a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This is what was prophesied about Jesus 700 plus years before he came. In Proverbs chapter 2, it says that the Lord grants wisdom for his mouth, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He's a wonderful counselor today. I wonder, do you know him as a wonderful counselor? Is there something that he has done? Have you experienced in your life the wonder of God? Where he has done the thing that you say, I can't even put words to what he has done in me. 
and in my family and in my life and in my whatever? Do you, have you experienced the wonder of God? This morning, we're going we're gonna to close our time. We're going to be praying for, for, for needs among us. We're going to be praying for those who may just need wisdom, who may need a supernatural, amazing, astonishing experience with God. You need healing in your life. You need a miracle in your family. He's a wonderful counselor. Counselor is a word that we defined in a lot of different ways, even in Scripture. The Greek word is parakletos. And the translation of that Greek word, uh, it's more about a function than a nature. It means to come alongside, to assist, to advise, or to support. John uses this term throughout the book of his, throughout his gospel, uh, that's translated also comforter, or helper, or advocate, paraclete. These are all names that define counselor. The term counselor in our modern age culture um, has several ideas. We, we call a counselor someone who is a, a psychologist or a therapist, who is trained, who has expertise in, in helping understand just your circumstances and situation. And, and I, I'm thankful for, for the people that we, can, that we can sit down with that understand how to walk us through some difficult times. Counselor is also a term that we use for, for an attorney. An attorney is, is often called a counselor. They come alongside and assist us in a time when we, when we need them. A pastor is also a term uh, uh, that, that refers to counselor. A counselor is, some, again, someone who comes alongside with knowledge and understanding. Two synonyms that describe Jesus as counselor, as, as wonderful counselor. One, he is our advisor. Jesus counsels us and advises us what is right and wrong. How many of you have ever had him speak into your life and speak into your heart in a moment and said, ah, 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 listen to that voice. Learn to listen to the voice of Jesus in your life. He does that through his word. He does that through the Holy Spirit. He's always there as counselor to encourage, to comfort, and to guide us. And let me tell you this. Jesus is the one who understands you when no one else gets you. He understands. He stands by us when everybody else turns away. He will help confront the past and help us with a new, fresh start. He has the power to help us in every situation. Psalm 16, verse 7 says, I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel, who gives me wisdom, who guides me, the New Living Translation. The New American Standard says, who has advised me. So we've got this idea of counseling, guiding, advising us. Jesus is the wisest man to have ever lived. He's the perfect counselor who has all the right answers all the time. And he's always available. You don't have to make an appointment. He's a great counselor. Because he has wisdom. And what does scripture say about wisdom if you lack wisdom? If any of you lacks wisdom, what should you do? Ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. Not only is he all-knowing, he's all-wise. Listen, Charles Spurgeon said the difference, wisdom, wisdom is the application of knowledge. There's something about knowing things and then there's something about the wisdom of things. Wisdom is applying knowledge. Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. Knowledge is knowing what to say. Wisdom is knowing when to say it or when not to say it. There's a difference. We need wisdom. We ask God who will give to us without finding fault, meaning he's not going to rebuke you for asking for it. He's going to give it to you generously. Second Peter chapter 1 says that by his divine power, God has given us everything that we need to live a godly life. Everything that we need. We've received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory, and excellence. I want to say with all of this information about who he is as a wonderful counselor, let me ask you this question. 
Do you go to God first for advice and counsel? Do you go to God first? I'm thankful for for counselors, and we have a number of counselors that are part of this church. I'm thankful for the wisdom of people who have lived longer than us, that we can go to them and ask for advice and get information and and direction and, and perspective. But there is nothing like wisdom that comes from God. I'm thankful for all those, but I'm so thankful that God gives us the wisdom that we need in the time that we need it. As wonderful counselor, not only does Jesus give great advice, he understands things that our finite minds will never understand, no matter how educated you are, will never be able to comprehend it. He knows things that you and I will never understand. He's a wonderful counselor with wisdom and understanding and insight on his plans and purpose for each of our lives. Listen, he can provide for us and he can guide us. He can direct and lead our lives. And he's never mistaken and he's never confused. He's always in control and he knows exactly what to do. This is our Jesus, our wonderful counselor. He always knows what to do at the right time when to do it. As a pastor... I need wisdom. Some of you come and say, hey, can I talk with you? What happens most of the time is I just listen. Because I always don't know what to say. I'm trusting in the Holy Spirit and God to guide us and give us wisdom in that. Listen to what it says in Isaiah again. Isaiah, toward the end of the book. Seek the Lord, chapter 55. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he is near. We need to seek after God. It goes on to say, let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for he will forgive generously. That is our God today. If you need forgiveness of sin, he will give that generously to you. But you've got to come to him, seek him and call on him while he is near. Turn to our God, he will forgive you. He goes on to say, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. And my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Why do we not go to him when we need wisdom? Can I I implore you to call on the Lord on a daily basis? When you need wisdom, ask him. Ask him. God, I need wisdom in this moment. And then listen. We have to learn how to discern the voice of God. He can give us wisdom. We have to tune in and be able to hear it. And then we have to put it to practice. This is our great God, Isaiah 46. He says, to whom will you compare me and who is my equal? Some people pour out their silver and gold and hire a craftsman to make a god from it. And then they bow down and worship it. They carry it around on their shoulders, and when they set it down, it stays there. It can't even move. And when someone prays to it, there is no answer. It can't rescue anyone from trouble. He's talking about the gods of the Old Testament and the idols. Guess what? We still make idols out of things thinking this thing is going to give me the answer. This thing is going to give me the fulfillment. This thing is going to give me a step forward. Listen, no one, no one but God is our wonderful counselor. It can't rescue anyone from trouble. Don't forget this, verse 8. Keep it in mind. Remember this, you guilty ones. Remember the things that I have done in the past, says the Lord. I alone am God. I am God and there is no one like me. Only I can tell you the future before it happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. God's plans and purposes is what prevails. He talks about knowing the future. We already saw that in Isaiah chapter 9, and we see the fulfillment of all those prophecies in the person of Jesus. I believe what he says. I believe what he knows. I believe that he can give us that wisdom if we will just call on him. What God says he will do, you can stake your life on it. I'm getting a little bit excited. I'm sorry. But it said, I had a note in there that said, preach this part. (laughs) As wonderful counselor, not only is he our advisor, but he's our advocate. 
1 John 2, 1. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He's our attorney. He's the one that goes to God for us. I want you to suppose for a minute that you've committed a brutal murder and you're arrested for it. You're sent to jail. You have no money. You can't afford a lawyer, so one is appointed to you by the court. And you find out that this attorney that is appointed to you by the court is the best attorney, attorney that you can find anywhere. He's the best that there is. Your trial comes, and the evidence against you is overwhelming. And you are convicted and you are sentenced to death. So much for having a good advocate, a good attorney. But something bizarre happens in the next moment. Your lawyer, your attorney, your advocate stands and approaches the bench and tells the judge that even though that you are guilty, he would like to take your place in your punishment of the death penalty. What do you think about that lawyer? A little confused? Why would he do that? Bewildered? Amazed? Astonished? For sure. Thankful beyond words? Listen, we know that that is exactly what Jesus did for us. We've all sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Every one of us has sinned against God. The penalty for sin is death. But Jesus comes alongside as our counselor, as our advocate, and takes our place on the cross. The wages of our sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And I want to ask you this question today. Will you come to him today? with everything in your life that is weighing you down. You don't have to clean yourself up to come to him. He takes every one of us just as we are. He came to us and he can handle anything that we bring to him. Our weakness, our pain, our suffering, our questions, our temptation, he can make a path through it because he knows everything about you and he cares about you. And he is that advocate that took your place, that died in your place so that you could live forever. This morning, if you don't know Jesus, if you've not experienced forgiveness and salvation today, it's a free gift. And he's here as a wonderful counselor to take your place. This morning, if you've not made that decision, I want to implore you to respond to Jesus. How many of you with heads bowed and eyes closed would just raise your hand and say, Pastor Jeff, I need that forgiveness. I need God to come into my situation, into my circumstances, into my life. If you'll just raise your hand and look at me this morning, I'm going to pray for you. Thank you. In the back. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Jesus, this morning we come to you, we bring our lives. We offer our our stuff, our sin, our trouble, the mess that we find ourselves in. We offer that to you and invite you into our lives to be a Lord of our life. I pray for these few, God, that raised their hand today. Lord, would you speak into their hearts and lives life? Would you bring light into the darkness of their lives? Lord, would you speak truth to them? to know that there is no one like you that can love them like you, that knows them like you, that can do something about their lives and that can bring them hope. Jesus, we offer ourselves to you. Forgive us of our sins. Give us life. Give us new life. Bring your hope, your salvation, your healing today. In each one of these lives, we pray. We thank you for life that you bring to us as our wonderful counselor. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask that you would stand with me across the room. There's a number of you that raised your hands this morning, and we want to come alongside you. 
as a, as a counselor, as a, as a helper, to come alongside you and help you in this journey following Christ. And so would you maybe stop at the, one of the, the desks in the lobby and give us your information so that we can help you. Uh, stop and talk to one of the pastors on the way out the door. But as we close today, here's, here's how I want us to close. We've been talking about wonderful counselors. And I, I just strongly believe today and as I was studying this week and just thinking about how to close this service, there are a lot of people who are hurting. A lot of people who need wisdom and insight and direction. There are a lot of people who need answers. Your situation, your circumstance, maybe it's a healing. Maybe it's something miraculous. You don't even know, you don't even know what to ask for. But you need the wonderful counselor today to minister to you in your circumstances and your situation. If you need healing, you need direction, you need wisdom, you need help of any kind. The wonderful counselor, God himself, Jesus Christ, your savior, the Holy Spirit is here to minister to you this morning. And as they sing this song, I wanna invite you to come and we wanna pray together with you. And if you feel led to come and pray with someone, I encourage you to do that. But let's take advantage of this moment right now. Don't step away from an opportunity to respond to God who has the authority, who has the ability to change your circumstances and to change your life. Would you come this morning as we pray?